Charles A. Kelly is a professional keyboardist and author who has been on sets with Stevie Wonder, Sister Sledge, and Nile Rodgers. In 2022, he released his debut album, You Are Not Alone, and is currently on the charts with his latest single, I Know You. We will interview him now on Six Zeros. Thank you for joining us, Charles. How you doing today? How you doing, Jay? What's going on, man? Doing amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2022, you dropped You Are Not Alone, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, and currently your single I Know You is number 30 on the Smooth Jazz Lister countdown, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Now, how does it feel uh, for uh, to have, you know, the listeners respond so well to your music? Well, to me, that's the most important thing. I mean, you know, us as artists, we we do a lot to get to a certain point in our career. But I think the most gratifying thing is when the listeners actually like your material and they voted in. So for me, this has been great. You know, um, I feel fortunate and blessed because since my album has been out, um, it hasn't left the charts, quite honestly. So um, to have my songs, different songs on the album be voted in by the listeners on a global level is the best feeling that an artist I think can have. Absolutely. So is this your first LP? Yeah, you know, this is this is my first solo artist LP. I've done a lot of production, um, be, you know, before I've, um, you know, when I first got into this thing many years ago, um, I was the music director for a little while for Sister Sledge and um, worked a lot with Stevie Wonder and so many other artists. And then I went and produced a lot of gospel records as well, Christian and gospel records. Um, but just recently I said to myself, you know, it, it is time to put out my first uh, solo record. I've, I've done some film scores and, and so forth, but when I did this, I was really surprised by the outcome. I mean, the response was really good. And, um, and then I immediately really got signed. So um, it, 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 was, it was something that I didn't expect to happen as quickly as it did. But of course, I'm grateful that it has happened and it's just kind of picked up. But this is the first one and I've got many more to go. Well, this first one is really good. Uh, one single that I like a lot is Endangered Species. And I think it kind of highlights like uh, like your music. It has a lot of different flavors to it in different times. Like it's like a a hodgepodge of a lot of different like influences it seems like like for instance on uh, endangered species what i like about it is like when it starts off like to me it takes me into like a herbie hancock calypso type space yeah then at 18 seconds it seems like there's a harpsichord stabs and there's a guitar and then then you smooth it out at 28 seconds with some sax and then you yeah. get with the keys at 36 so it's like you get this smorgage board of of sounds and you can hear it throughout the album how is it uh like producing something like that like creating something like that where you have all these different types of styles and sounds but still make it sound as cohesive as it does on this album yeah that that's an interesting an interesting question i get that a lot i mean for me it's easy because of my background you know i i grew up in philadelphia and you know the heroes that i grew up with were older jazz artists. I mean, we've opened up for people, I've opened up for people like Freddie Hubbard. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've run across people like Grover Washington from Philadelphia and so forth. You know, I grew up in, in groups um, that had Robin Eubanks, Kevin Eubanks, the trombonist, Kevin Eubanks and Billy Johnson, who was in Frankie Beverly and Mays and then later worked with Santana. So we were all in local groups and we played all different types of styles. You know, I come from I come from Herbie and Joe Sample and George Duke. You know, that's kind of where I come from. So, you know, when I when I went to Europe, I did a tour with Sister Sledge years ago and I, I really started to really fall in love with what a lot of the artists from England was doing as well, like, you know, groups like Genesis and so forth. And that was really hard to, to try to, you know, deal with because when, you know, when I was first coming out, everything in the States are very labeled. They're very structured in terms of the markets. So if you said that you want to do something out of funk 
or 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 jazz or R&B, you know, they would give you a sideways look like, oh, you can't do that. But I always wanted to do other things. So as 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 things are now, if you if you make it cohesive, then you can really do what you wanted to do. And I feel fortunate because the label Inner Vision Records, my label, I love them. They they've given me kind of a green light to do that. So, you know, it's it's easy, I think, for me because of the things I've said. And then also my my mission, I guess, as an artist is not to be pigeonholed. You know, I, I want to venture out. You know what the the next album that I want to put out is going to be a little bit more adventurous. You know, one of the one of the artists um, that I love are the Yellow Jackets. You know, I, I absolutely love what they do musically. Um, and all the groups, you know, like 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 what Prince did. You know, I, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Prince's music and also how he musically made sure that he wasn't pigeonholed into anything. So for me, those are the guys that I look to. You know, I, I plan on doing a, lo- a, a lot more of that in the future, but still making it smooth jazz and bringing people into the fold so that our, um, you know, so that our, our, uh, our music can grow. That, that was an interesting point you had on uh, the rigidity of like in, in American music. Uh, like, for instance, like if you get put in a particular genre, it's kind of like you're almost typecasted in right. a way. So right. it is interesting, like how you say, like you have the smooth jazz label, but you put all these additional types of styles in it so that, you know, you could be true to yourself and and true to your musicianship, but kind of find a lane where where you can do that. Because, like, for instance, if you are labeled R&B, right. there is a template there and you can't veer from that template. Is that a, is that am I uh, reiterating what you said properly? Yeah, I, I, I think I think that happens quite a bit. And um, I try to shy away from that. Like, like for an example, um, my my son and my daughter, you know, they they do a lot of neo soul and a lot of rap and hip hop. So I know that you don't see a lot of that in smooth jazz. But I would love to take some of those elements and put it in there. You know, another one of my heroes was Miles Davis, and Miles Davis was really big on making sure that he was never pigeonholed that he explored all different genres and made the music his own so i refuse to 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 be pigeonholed like that i don't think that you need to do that and i think it's very healthy for um uh for artists to explore themselves and be like you said authentically you know themselves so um as long as um i feel that that the audience responds to it I think it's a good thing to do and uh not to beat a dead horse but you mentioned two amazing artists prince and miles davis it's like yeah. when miles davis started really adventuring like with on the corner and started having all these funk influences it's like people in retrospect respected it but a lot of people at the time were like hey get back in your box okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It, but now when you look back you're like oh, okay this was actually something amazing and now people want to talk about on the corner and bitches brew and all that now it's like it's it's like something to bitch it at the coffee shop that seem like you know you're down but at the time people were like hey uh, i don't like this so yeah music is fluid music comes from the soul it doesn't have to be strictly defined and trapped in this box and once again like you said prince was amazing at doing that prince would drop a funk album then a rock album and it's something exactly. that ain't got a label on it exactly and 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 what i get from both of those artists and what i'm trying to put into my my music is be fear is being fearless you know miles davis was fearless he didn't he didn't adhere to the rules he didn't adhere to well you got to do this and you got to do this you got to do this he was fearless in being himself and he was fearless in knowing that if he delivered great music people would respond and people would would listen you know prince did the same thing i mean you know when you look at what prince did um years ago he took the same um mindset that stevie wonder took you know whereas you know and i've seen steve do this play all the instruments on the album you know and then 
and then have a rock song, but then have a jazz song and then have an R&B song like, you know, Lady Cab Driver and things like that on the same album as as, you know, something else that's totally different, that's in a totally different genre. So it's about not being label. I believe it's not about being, you know, allowed to be put into or forced to be put into a, 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 a category. It's about being authentic and being fearless and having the strength to stand on that. If your music is good, it's going to speak for itself and you got to be able to stand on it. Now, as a jazz artist, wouldn't you say that is like a, a core tenet of the genre to be adventurous and not to be confined by rules? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when you when you when you really look at the history of jazz, <clears throat> it's kind of always been that way. I mean, even if you go back to Duke Ellington, you go back to <clears throat> to some of the things that even George Gershwin did. Now, I'm, I'm really going back now. You know, they they made it <clears throat> they made it their their goal to mix classical with jazz and to really mix it up in a way where it was over the top you know george gershwin who was a um who was who was a, a, a an american writer he used a lot he was white but he used a lot of african americans in his music which was kind of you know unprecedented at the time so i think that when you look at the history of jazz it's always had this adventure when you look at what charlie parker did when you look at what john coltrane did you know when you go into the avant-garde side of things or when you look at somebody like Farrell saunders all these guys were very adventurous and they didn't worry about the money although they made money but they didn't they didn't look at it from a money or monetary point of view or look at it from like well I've got to do this in order to hit the charts. They they really stood on what they believed in. in they, they stood on what they believed was right musically. And they let that, you know, speak for itself. And that's kind of the that's kind of the lane that I want to take. You know, of course, I'm willing to to to, you know, work within the confines of smooth jazz and my singles and so forth. But I'm adventurous and I want to. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to go out, you know, for me, it's great to be able to do something that let's say like, like a Peter Gabriel did and mix that in with something that a Coltrane did, you know, because both of those artists are in me as well. So I try to be fearless. I try to look at the giants that went before me and not to pattern them, but to build on what they, what they did so I can push music forward absolutely we got it we're standing on top of the shoulders of giants and then we got to move it forward we don't exactly. just stay in what they do and and it's about that balance too you got to balance like giving let's say the streets what they want but also being adventurous and once you find that balance yeah. and what works yeah then it is uh it's an amazing thing so you've mentioned some names of individuals you work with some additional like neil diamond uh, yeah. Elton John, the Pointer yeah. Sisters, and my favorite guitarist ever in history, Nile Rodgers. I love how that man plays. Now, you've worked with them. Now, in what capacity? Were you a touring musician or were you the, a music director? Well, different ways. When, when, when I was with Sister Sledge, Kathy and I went to school together. We went to high school and uh, we, we wrote a lot of songs. And um, she came out here and she started doing some things out here. She contacted me and I did a couple tours and um, people like um, Donnell Spencer Jr. was part of the group as well, um, other people. And we wrote for the song, I, I mean, for the album, The Boy Meets the Girls. And I wrote a song, I, out of all the songs I wrote with her, um the one that that got selected for, on the album was hold out poppy that song was done by um nile rogers was produced by nile rogers and herbert hancock played on it so by that i had a chance to work with them and um and 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 that was great when i was and then while i was out here the reason i came out to california is that i was signed to a record deal with stevie wonder years ago steve had a record company called one direction and there were a lot of people that were uh in, in, involved with that 
And I learned so much by working with Steve. I was signed with him in Motown for probably about eight or nine years. And we had a chance to work with everybody. I had a chance to work with Neil Diamond, people that came in the studio and so forth. Um, so that's really where I really start to understand how to put together songs and how to produce and what to leave in songs and what to take out of songs. You know, one thing that Steve told me, and I always say this story because um, to me, it, it's, it's just very, um, very insightful. And I was proud one day because I was working on some stuff and I did four songs in one day. And Steve said, well, you know, that's kind of cool. But he said, why don't you take four days to do one song? And when you think about it, what he was what he was alluding to is that what you put out, make sure it's really solid and make sure that it's really good. So after really thinking about that and working with him for so long, you know, I really kind of gravitated toward that advice and taking it. So no matter who I work with at this point, I try to take my time because a lot of things that we think we hear in the morning time, let's say for instance, if we're working at 12 o'clock or one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, and we think it's good, after we get a good night's rest, it may not be as good as we think it is. So that, that I'm sorry, I have to interject on it. That is absolute fact. Sometimes <laughs> when you're working on it, it sounds amazing. You're yeah. like, and then you wake up in the morning, you're like, ah, oh, this is actually, sometimes I woke up in the morning, I'm like, this is actually kind of trash, but I was feeling myself yeah. last <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 that happens a lot. And I, I think what happens is that a lot of artists, they don't give their ear a chance to really rest and let the music germinate and let it kind of you know, let it mature. So working with Steve, he really hammered that in, you know, like I was there with Steve in the, in the, in the eighties and, you know, he would, he would wait like years sometimes before he put out an album and he would record like every day. People didn't, I don't know if people really understood that unless they were in there with him, but Steve would record a song a day. But a lot of that never made his album. You know, it was, it's, it, it's in a vault somewhere. But, you know, he made sure that what he released was at the top of its level. And, you know, I've tried to take that same lane. You know, I, I do a lot of work. I work every day. I, I'm recording every day. But every song doesn't make the record. And Prince does the same thing. You know, when Prince passed, you know, he had hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of songs in his vault so i think it's one of these things that when you work with some of these people you start to understand that there's levels to it and if you want to be really at that top level then you have to kind of you know be willing to do what needs to be done and you know it takes a lot more work when you have to maybe wait um you know, maybe, you know, five or six more months to put us something out as opposed to rushing something out for a monetary gain or for um, some kind of agenda. Because at the end of the day, the music has to stand on its own. And also, uh, once you put it out, you can't pull it back in. So yeah, I, yeah, to make sure it's right. Yeah, I think uh, uh, one, uh, uh, an analogy I, that 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 sinks in for me is like let the dough rise. Sometimes <laughs> you got to give the time. You got to yeah. let the dough rise. But then it, it also speaks to, and I want to touch, go back to a couple of things you said. But it speaks to how disposable music is today. Uh, like when you think of legends like Stevie Wonder and Nile Rodgers and these people, they have bona fide classes. They have 50 year old songs that you would put on right now and everyone will, everyone will start bopping to it. And a lot of music that's just, you know, just put on, that's just recorded and released. You know, it's not gonna, we're not gonna be talking about a year from now or two years from now or three years from now. Right. Cause it's disposable. Right. And and that's that's exactly right. That's why for me it's important to write material that is timeless that's going to last you know that's why 
when I listen to um, even, you know, Santana or Fracking Beverly Mays and some of these other older artists, you know, their material will, will, will stand the test of time and they don't get locked into stuff. So it's about the material. It's about making sure that you present the material in the right way. You don't worry about the other stuff. You don't, you don't, you don't worry about it. And, and the thing is, is what I've learned is that people will always gravitate towards quality. They will always gravitate towards quality. They may get off on something that's trendy. I get that. But at the end of the day, quality always wins out. It always does. I'll concur with that. Uh, now, I want to go back to something you said. So you wrote that song. I believe you, you were in high school when you said you wrote a song and then it was recorded. Uh, Nile Rogers produced it and then Herbie Hancock played on it. Yeah, Herbie, Herbie, played, wow. he, Herbie played the keyboards on it. And, um, you know, it, it was it was very interesting. He he did the keyboards. I ran into him a, a few years later. He was working with Stevie at Steve's studio and they were getting ready to do the Grammys. And I said, Herbie, I don't know if you remember, but you played on this song. And he was like, oh, yeah, I do remember. And I think it's one of these things because, you know, you have to understand how Herbie, Herbie's, Herbie's a genius. Herbie's a genius, you know. And, you know, this is the era. Now, and, and, and Herbie went through his transition, too, because, you know, when you look at some of the stuff that he did, I think he did a song called Rocket. And, um, yep. and, as great as Herbie is, he transitioned into more of an electronic style too. So this was during that period, you know, um, he played a DX seven and played some other things. So he was experimenting. I think Niles Rogers, uh, was experimenting as well, but Niles was a, he was a legend at that point. He was a legend. Um, so that was really kind of a good thing. You know, the, their album, the, sister, the, the song went gold, and um, in Europe, they really did well. They did much better later in their career in Europe than they did in the United States. So um, I was just fortunate to be able to, you know, to work with Herbie on that. I was, I was fortunate to have Nile Rogers produce that. Um, and... I'm looking forward, you know, hopefully I can work with Kathy again. You know, I mean, we, we've been knowing each other, man. I don't want, I don't want to put the ages out there, but we've been working with each other. I mean, knowing each other for so, so, so long. Um, she reached out not too long ago and I may reach out to her and hopefully I can get her to do something on my next album. I would love that. You, you aged yourself when you said that uh, you were working with her. you were you were around Herbie Hancock when he started experimenting with computers and <laughs> yeah aged, I, I I had to keep my composure I was like wow he's that old <laughs> <laughs> yeah man I I remember I remember you know when electronic stuff was first starting you know and um, it was so interesting for me because you know everything was analog like back in the 80s you had these real big studios but steve and people like herbie they were starting to gravitate more towards digital stuff and more towards computer stuff and and digital recording so for me it was it was it was just great because i was on i was on the the real learning curve of all of that in the late 80s, early 90s. So when things really transitioned, when you had hip hop come in in the 90s, and then, you know, you had the gangster rap where now you have real beat makers making beats. A lot of people didn't make that, that trans, a lot of older musicians didn't make that transition. But I was already there because I was a kid working with those guys. So I was already there. So by the time the 90s rolled in, I had already had, I already started to build my home studio. Okay, so so you were ahead of the curve with the the digital audio workstation and all that. Do you remember what yeah. your your first uh, setup was? Yeah, I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, okay, I had an old, I had an old Apple Macintosh Plus. Okay, there was no, um, there was no digital that we know of now, meaning that, meaning that you didn't record 
like on on Pro Tools or anything like that. You had to hook up the keyboards through MIDI. Yep. Okay. And I had an old plus, and what I would do is that I would record it to either a Fostex or a, um or um some other kind of like a like a four track on a cassette. But the thing is that it was a fat sound. Later, later, I started using a DAT, a, a digital audio tape machine to do that. Okay. Um, but the sound was much fatter because you're still, even though it's coming off of the computer, you're getting the actual sounds from the keyboards going into the ADAT or going into the actual audio cassette tape. And it was, it was much fatter at that time than trying to do some kind of digital. Now, Steve, what Steve was doing, he was way ahead of the curve because he used, um, he was working with, with, uh, 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 with Japan and he was using Kurtzwalls and he was using what they call these New England digital machines, um, sync claviers and, and, and so forth. And he was working on at that time, um, uh, um, recording things over the phone through Jap with Japan. What? And so this was, yeah, this was back in around 86, 87. A lot of people don't know that. Okay. But Steve was, he was, he was a pioneer. You know, he was a pioneer. Not only is he a genius, he's a pioneer in this. Now, back then, the, the, the digital, the digital recordings were real thin. Yes. So a lot of people didn't want to use it. You know, everybody was still using the big ampex the two inch reels and things like that because it was still a fatter sound you know that's what that's what michael jackson everybody was using so it took a while for that technology to really catch up you know just about maybe about seven years ago was when i started to really sell a lot of my analog um gear okay because i felt as though i didn't really need to i i i I didn't really need it anymore. And that was only about seven, seven, eight years ago. Now you really can't tell because a lot of the people that are growing up now, all they're used to is digital recording. But there's something that still is said about the thickness and fatness of analog. And then also, you know, when, when uh, people go to master things, I'm sure, you know, that they're still mastering using some of that analog gear because it's still real fat. Yeah, there, there's a the analog sound is just uh, when when you have a trained ear, there's just nothing like it. It's like the waveforms are unaltered. It's just an amazing uh, sound. Like one band I like, this is in a different uh, uh, genre, but the Foo Fighters, yeah. their album Wasting Light, they recorded that analog with Butch Vig, and yeah. it's just the warmth and just the the the, the fatness of the sound. It, it's just a gorgeous sounding album and but yeah. one of the things with digital i know you're loving not having to bounce down your tracks like when you were saying you were recording i think it was a four track i'm like oh man how many tracks you got i know you was bouncing <laughs> it was a ton and 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 it was it was hard to keep everything in sync because you had to use sympathy so so let's say for instance you record four now if you want to record four more because you had to you had to record that then you had to bounce it and then if you want to record more, you have to sync up the track to, to your, to your rig. So, and Simpty was the way to do that. So you would have to use Simpty and then you would have to record for more and bounce those and bounce those and bounce those. So, um, it was a process. It was definitely a process. Um, but I, but that's how I learned. That's really how I learned, you know? Um, and at this point you know now i i produce my own stuff i really don't really need a producer you know i mean i'm not i, I would say this jay it's not that i'm opposed to producing you know having somebody else produce it if i want to get a different perspective i'm not opposed to that but i love writing producing arranging my own material 
yeah that's totally understandable especially if the output is good too you know sometimes you don't need that to have that other person like kind of you know trying to supervise your vision you know if you exactly. got it you know you know you know what you want and then last point on, on that uh uh it's uh, the the recording nowadays is so cool where you know you have all your patches in the computer and then yeah. you just have a midi controller as opposed to in the days where you know you had to have the patches in your device and you had to do the audio into the interface and yeah. then the midi so it's like it's evolved so much but then it's like it's like i want to i want your opinion on this because i feel like it is it's evolved so much that it's removed in my opinion a lot of what made a music so great like especially like in the 70s which i feel like was the golden era of black american music yeah i feel like when you had all these musicians in there having a jam session it it it, it you had so many different uh individuals contributing to the music but now you have one person in front of the computer doing everything and in a lot of ways i feel like it's yielded music that is just not as uh, well thought out and as layered as it was in the past what are your thoughts on that? yeah i i totally agree with that i i really i would say this i'm not against somebody doing all the tracks i'm not against that but i think it's better when you have contribution from other musicians in addition to certain things that you want to do on your own so like on my album i made sure that all the songs were organic i made sure that everybody you know contributed to them um even though i did all the demos and everything myself when i sent them out i said now how would you how you know what would you do in this song what would you do in this song because you're right there is something to be said for you know replacing real musicians i definitely want to use real musicians and, and my album is filled with that but the thing is that what what is good about it is that you get a chance without if put this way if you're set up well you get a chance to really know your direction of your of your album or your project without having to spend a lot of money years ago you had to have a lot of musicians in the studio and if you didn't have a real clear-cut understanding things would take a long time because everybody had their input everybody had their say so and you know it's one thing if you're practicing to record it's another thing if you're actually in the studio eating up studio time because back then the cost of studio time you're talking about 150 you know 200 dollars an hour so that cost was absolutely you know over the top so I think now as a producer, I get a chance to work on everything that I want to work on before I give it to somebody. I give them a direction and then now they kind of know where I'm at because I've given them an idea of what it should be and then they can go forward from there. Again, I go back to go, uh, to uh, uh, um, um, artists like Steve and Prince because that's what they did. You know, if you look at at Steve, you know, he he recorded almost everything himself in the beginning. You know, when you know, after after he started to become a little bit more independent from Motown when he started going into Intervision and and fulfilling his first first finale and, and you know, that the golden era of the 70s, yeah, he used a lot of musicians. He used he used a lot of guys that I still know, but he made sure that he put his total footprint on this album in terms of direction and prince certainly did that you know prince um when he got his record deal he basically said that he's going to do it all himself and he did a lot of that up until probably um uh, 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 um you know all the way through maybe his first four or five albums so there is you know there is a medium between both meaning that if you're a producer you can get all your thoughts together before you give it to the musicians. But I don't think technology should replace real musicians. Uh, that's an excellent point. And, and on that Prince though, Prince did that so much. He even did it for the time. Here's your album guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that's a great point. You said like you could basically get all your thoughts out uh, and then 
it's kind of like you, you, you the studio is like kind of college you're going to the studio with a plan now like yeah you know because like back in the days like you said that's the cost of studio time basically made it so that most of the musicians especially in our community couldn't even go in the studio so you if you if the musicians weren't your friends from the block or from school and y'all jamming in someone's apartment or garage you're basically not going to be able to make an album exactly and see and then you're you're jay you're you're so much on point because that's where my mindset came from trying to do four songs in a day whereas steve said well try to do try to spend four days on one song because when you're in the studio and your mindset is money i'm spending all this money i gotta cut this stuff really quickly and get out because i don't have any more money left <laughs> so so you're thinking about you know how much stuff i can cut how fast i can get it done and what what a lot of musicians you know unfortunately did was that they had to they had to cut back and compromise on the quality you know and that's a tragic that's that's really a tragic a tragedy now yes you know once you get a record deal what's interesting about that years ago is that yeah you get the record deal but if you're spending all of your money in the studio now you have very limited funds for promotion yeah. so a lot of artists would go broke even though they may have had a gold record or they may have had success but they spent so much money to get there they're still in the hole and the, th the crazy thing is like and I, i'm not gonna say anything too controversial but it's like the studio the the record label might have a connection with the studio but they're gonna make you recoup all them costs exactly. like, no this is a racket this is a scam exactly because because especially back then you know everything was recoupable because it was really a loan it was an advance against your earnings and your royalties so um, nowadays it's so cool and, and that's what I tell young artists now is that if you set yourself up you know you can do whatever you need to do I mean if you if you if and I'm just using this as an example let's say you put together a dope studio you spend about fourteen fifteen thousand dollars you can do that by working at someplace like Amazon if you if, if you plan correctly you work at Amazon let's say for a year or two I know it may be hard work I get that but if you work there for a couple of years or so, you can buy the equipment to be competitive so that now when you get yourself together, you can fine tune everything that you're about as an artist, okay? Before you spend any additional money because the money that ultimately that you need to spend money on is promotion and promoting your, your songs and, and getting them out there. Any record label will love that because if they don't have to spend money on your production or as much money in your production you know then they're, they're saving money and then if you're producing really good stuff they love you and then in some cases you might not even have to go through them because the distribution exactly is all you get it on spotify you start doing some dances on tiktok next thing you know you know you you bring it into dough so there's still a need for them in some capacity but a lot of newer people you know, you might not have to even go, I mean, a newer upcoming artist, you might not even have to go through that entire <laughs> bureaucracy uh, if you don't feel like you need it. If you have the ability to produce it yourself and you have the ability to market it, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, you might be a good house. Now, pivoting a little bit, you're also a professor, correct? Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor of um, business administration and I'm a professor as well. Um, I love doing that and I teach all different music production and I teach the business of music and so forth. So um, I love that end of it because I think that especially in our community, we have so many gifted artists. You know, I mean, if you look back in Philadelphia and you look in New York and in other pockets of the country, every block, there's a gifted, there's a gifted musician or gifted rap rapper or, you know, they're good but a lot of them don't really understand how to do it. So like, for instance, like 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 myself, right? When I put out Endangered Species, I just put that out as a single. Originally, the labels turned me down, okay? So I said, okay, that's okay. I'm gonna put it out myself. You know, because this standard, you know, if you go to try to get a deal, they, they turn you down, right? 
if for whatever reason but i put it out myself and the response was so was so good on it they doubled back around that's awesome they, they doubled back around so i tell artists this if you know what you're doing and you really and you're really locked in to your sound and you understand who you are as an artist and then you lock into promoting it through who you are trying to reach then you can bypass a lot of things and prince proved that you know when prince was in his deal you know he you know when he wrote in, in the 90s he wrote slave on his face he was trying to get out of his deal with warner brothers but what he proved was that with the most beautiful girl in the world that song that you can do this without a label yep you can really do this without a label if you know what you're doing and you understand the different things i mean you know what artists have to do i believe and i teach this in my classes is that is that if you're going to get a studio get you don't have to get a lot but the pieces that you need to get make sure they're competitive enough to compete they're good yeah. enough to compete right your interface um your microphones if you're a really gifted artist and you have a screwed up microphone it doesn't matter mm -hmm. get yourself a really good microphone get yourself a computer that's good enough to process what you need to process so you got to do your research you got a budget but then once you get once you get it really well the mastering side i would never master it myself if you're trying to compete yep. you want to take it to the to the masters the, 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 the master engineers that are the leaders of those genres so for instance you know if you are trying to venture into r b and hip-hop there's a few really good um, um respected engineers that are mastering hits so if you go to those guys that are mastering hits and you have something that's mixed and mastered and good because the cost of mastering has come down okay then that's an investment okay because they understand what's conducive for radio so it's just understanding i think i think our people have to really understand you know how it's really done and you don't have to spend a grip of money you just got to know what money to spend and you got to know you have to know what you want to do and you got to you got to create a plan you have to create a plan yeah i think what you're touching on is 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 the business side of it and that's the part that i feel like you know like as our community we have to take the reins of and that's one of the things that prince was doing yeah. you know it's like one one group has the capital but then we have the talent you know and so we have to stop that that relationship where it's like well i need the capital it's like especially now it's like okay get your get the right audio interface get in the right room get the right, right mic uh, right. learn how to uh mix it then go to a go to the uh someone have someone master it okay right or even have someone a professional mix and master it so that when your song come on it's not like 10 decibels under the exactly you know? <laughs> so exactly. do that get your stuff up to market parity because actually the market doesn't care if you don't have the money or anything exactly. get it up to parity with the competition Right. and then drop it and i think you put you showed an excellent example of that like endangered species they were sleeping on you so it's like okay i'm gonna do it myself i'm gonna put it out there right. and show you that this is some good product right that the streets will take to and they took to it and then they have to come back and say yo we were sleeping on you but we see that you have what it takes and then they also show entrepreneurship on your part so exactly. it's like if we do bring this guy on a label i know i'm not gonna have to babysit him exactly and, and and those are those are key points you know um what a lot of times i i think that in, in our in our community you know and i would love to talk to young people about this because what a label will do a lot of times i mean not my label my label is great so leave that they're they're wonderful but i've seen this happen before where they'll give somebody an advance let's say for instance you know those those multi multi-million dollar advances they don't exist too more but you know, let's say if they say, well, we're going to give you a $200,000 advance. Immediately, what a lot of artists will do is go, 
you know, they'll get a Range Rover. Yeah. Okay. They'll get a couple of chains. You know, they'll go out to a club because now their mindset is that, well, the girls, and, and, and this is real talk. The girls didn't like me before I got my deal. Now I got some money in my pocket. Now I can get the girls that are all over me. That's the, that's the trap that a lot of artists fall in and quite yep. frankly labels don't mind that because if they can get you in the loop of having to stay with them okay then they're fine because now their mindset is this well especially if it's a 360 deal if you're, if you're signed to a 360 deal and now they're cutting in on your ability to tour and merchandise and and and, and make money from that they're going to make their money, okay? And you don't think that, well, you know, it's going to hurt you because you're spending all this money. But the thing is that it does because many times we don't really get it. It's not our money. It is an advance. Yes. It's and, an advance. And if you have to, if you recoup on that little 1% that you get, <laughs> right. you are... In that contract forever, you're gonna be at the Met Gala broke, right? Wonder right. like where did it go wrong? It went right. wrong where you didn't understand the paperwork, right? And, and you 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 have to pay back that two hundred thousand. You know you got the Range Rover that depreciated immediately off the lot. Then you got the wheels on it. <laughs> With that two hundred thousand, not knowing that it's a loan that you're gonna exactly. have to pay back off exactly. your one percent exactly exactly and so many so many young people don't really get that they don't they don't really understand it you know um you know uh there was there was an artist years and years ago right and before my time but i use this as an example howling wolf right he was signed with um cadillac records right was it was it was it cadillac records yes i think so yeah with um uh, uh, uh um uh with 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 Bo Diddley and some of them is it Bo Diddley I think was with there and then and then also there was um uh um Chuck Berry when they signed him all the other guys had like cat they were buying Cadillacs and they were just spending their money what Howlin Wolf said was that don't give me anything mm -hmm. if I haven't earned it so a lot of these other guys, you know, they were driving Cadillacs, they were getting the girls. He was driving an old beat up truck, right? Eventually he made money and eventually he kept all his money because he invested it wisely. Yeah. A lot of these other guys, they start to go broke. Why? Because, you know, they didn't spend their money wisely. The best thing an artist could do, especially you know coming up just invest in your studio mm -hmm. and take the production cost off the budget Preach. take it off the budget because there is nothing more gratifying to know that you can work and i'm just i'm just using this as an example you can work 16 hours in your house on your craft without having to spend a dime that and, and is I, worth that's worth this weight right there that's worth this weight in gold and i think what you're what you're highlighting is an investment take the money and invest it because that's an investment because yes. if you you know like i'm the type the creative type of person that my best thoughts come at night and sometimes i get a hot idea in the middle of the night if you if you're relying on some other entity to provide you the ability to lay them thoughts down right um you know you're you're not going to be able to work as flexibly so i think that's a great point like as artists take if you get any money if you're going to go into the label apparatus labyrinth thing like that one understand the business understand mechanicals understand publishing understand that but then if you do get any money invest it look at it as a business because the label looks at it as a business they don't they don't look at you as like some cool guy that makes a great song it's <laughs> like that great song is how i'm gonna make some more money so exactly. look at it from that perspective and then you'll be going into it you know understanding it and i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna talk about five circles real quick but i just want to hit on one another point if sam cook knew there was a problem no one has an excuse 
Sam <laughs> Cook knew something was wrong. If you're still signing these silly deals, it's your fault at this point. Exactly. Exactly. You know, even, 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 you know, everybody looks at James Brown as being, and he is, he's phenomenal. He's, he's probably the most influential African-American artist in the 60s. Okay. He really, really, really was influential. But people don't really realize this guy had access to his own studio. So when he would cut, he would make sure he had the ability to go play it on the radio. Well, actually first go get it, get it manufactured, release it, and then play it on his own radio station. Now, you know, he was a visionary on the business side of things. Okay. He made sure that he had control over his money on his concerts. So you know they need to our we we need to look at how to keep the money yep. and how to channel it okay and that's the thing is that I, I i think that that sometimes we spend so much time and energy on the image yeah and being and and and, and 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 trying to be that star but that that doesn't last long Okay, the thing is that if you want to have longevity in this industry, you have to make that investment for the lean times. And if you can do that when you're only making a little bit of money and they it comes, you know, there's certain times when you're making a lot of money and there's more times when you're just making even money. And then there's many times when you're not making hardly any money. Okay. But you have to set yourself up for success for the long haul. And the only way to do that is by reinvesting in yourself the proper way to to close out that 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 portion of the interview i think it's best that like black people just look at everything as a business and look at yourself as an entrepreneur yeah. don't uh don't be a guy with a cup hoping someone puts some change in you take take control of your career look at it like okay i have all these different revenue sources from this music how I'm, how can I uh, generate revenue off this and what can I do on my own and what do I need a partner for and then right. when it's time to get that partner you bring them in as a partner and yes. not as an overseer when you bring them in as an overseer then it's over then it's over you know and 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 you know to his credit you know I, I hated to see what happened you know with the whole Nipsey hustle thing I just hated to see that but this guy was revolutionary in how yes. he was thinking. You know, he was really he really had had his business mindset together in, in terms of real estate and and how he was using the technology to make money and how he forced them to deal with him at a distribution level now when you look at all these things that you have now with um with nfts and all these different things and so forth when you're looking at the future when you're going towards blockchain and all these other things and you know, smart contracts and so forth. There's so many different ways that we as artists can make money. Okay. And we just can't give it away mm -hmm. because we let our egos or we let our, our, our need for validation. Yeah. 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 We don't need to be validated. We're already, look, if, if they're coming for you, that should be validation enough that, that you have something that is of value. Okay, you don't need to be validated by anybody else. You know, if somebody's saying you have great music and, and you're getting hits and the labels are saying, man, we, we love your music, that's, that should be validation enough. You don't need to go out to the clubs and do all that stuff. All you got to do is just say, okay, let me sit down with myself. Let me really understand what I need to do. If you look at, you know, um, you know, what, what, you know, Put it this way, Nipsey Hussle, he laid the he laid the groundwork for a lot of different things. It's all into reinvestment. It's all into, you know, uh, uh, um, and it, look, the way the way things are now. OK, you can you can use the industry as a means of setting up your own business. Yes. You, you leverage that celebrity in a way where you say, OK, now 
you know, because I can do this, I can push, prom- I can push and promote product. I can do this and I can do that. And that's how, that's how, you know, these artists need to be thinking. A lot of them are thinking like that. I think that coming out, okay, if you already have certain things in place, if you, if you don't have to pay for production, you don't have to do those things, you still gonna have to pay for promotion. Okay. But if you don't have to pay for, for production, then you're, you're, you're you're 60 percent already there yeah amen and so i want to move on to five circles so you wrote a book called yeah. five circles and it talks about church growth through music and you and in the five circles you hit uh like culture i think ethnicity genders generation and the center majority yeah. um you mind covering that like what was the um what was the goal behind writing that book and and how was the reception to it for it yeah, it's it's at, it's actually being been really good. The mindset behind five circles is just like what you said, ethnicity and so forth, right? All the other things that go into the components. It's the sweet spot that really ultimately grows the church. So for instance, you know, if you're if you're like for instance where I live out here um, in the Inland Empire, this is a very mixed area, right? You have let's say for instance you have 33 percent white 33 percent african-american 33 percent hispanic okay everybody has their own music everybody has their own culture everybody has their own you know hardcore you know lingo that they that they speak with but the thing is this in a church if you try to cover all of that okay it becomes really difficult because mm-hmm. now somebody's going to be upset here somebody's going to be upset here but that circle if you look at the demographics and you can and you come up with a mindset to hit the general population then you can start growing it from that perspective and you can increase in value as opposed to you know doing something that's so far out this way or so far out this way so for instance you know and I'm not trying to put a hint on it, but let's say if you're playing real hardcore acid rock in a multicultural area, that may not hit as much. Okay. But let's say, for instance, if you're playing something like, like, um, uh, uh, um, you know, try Tibet, or you're doing something like uh, Israel Holton, for example, okay, that covers that sweet spot, that sweet area, okay now all of a sudden you can you can gain congregation members so i was a worship leader i'm still a worship leader at another church but at the time when i wrote this um i was a worship leader in one of the largest churches in rialto and i i was there for 15 years we started out with about 500 people in the congregation using this technique we grew to about eight or about seven to eight thousand members Wow. Okay. And it was it was it was the pastor who who had the mindset he understood that church wasn't wasn't about black or white, you know. There's a lot of issues and I don't want to go into that cuz I got other books that's coming yeah. up that's talking about things, right? But but you know, the bottom line is that, you know, church is for everybody. This God is for everybody. Okay, Christ is for everybody. It's not a black or white issue. So the thing is that if you take it from that perspective and you remove all the stigmas and you remove the, the negativities and, and the racism and all of that stuff that we know that's been there for many years. And if you go all the way back to the doctrine of discovery, which is going to be later on, and I'm going to be talking about, if you go back to all those things, um, and, and, and you understand that God never intended for the racism to be there. It's not, it's not the word of God that's bad. It is the people who took the word and used it for their own purposes. That's what made it bad. So he understood that. And we took this, we took this uh, approach of saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to reach out to everybody. But we're going to do it in a way where it's not so fringe. It's like within that circle. It's within the things that we know that are appealing to all these different groups. And we were able to 
we were able to grow it by leaps and bounds. I mean, it, it was it was tremendous. It was tremendous. That's now that you broke with the five circles, it are that's actually that's really good marketing. That's actually very genius. It's like you're gonna you find that middle ground that yeah. works for like it, if it works for 50 or 60 percent of the population, you know, that's where we want to target as opposed to going hard for the 20 percent here yeah. and the 20 or the 33 percent there or the 33 percent there let's get like a good 60 percent yeah that's composed of all of them yeah yeah because you know i mean think about it right you have some churches that may have 20 congregation members and they have grandma singing right well that's cool that's cool that grandma sings we get that <laughs> but the quality of that is not going to be conducive to bringing in new members okay and the whole thing about about god is feed my sheep you know go out and spread the gospel so that's a commandment from the scripture so the thing is that if you're not doing those things that's going to be bringing in people then what are you really doing are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it to spread the word so people and churches and pastors and worship leaders they have to go back and rethink it now it's good that grandma is singing we get that but if she is not singing quality music and she's out of key and people don't want to come then that's not good the thing is that what people need to understand the 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 world is used to quality you know people my age they grew up listening to michael jackson they grew up listening to madonna they grew up listening to earth wind and fire so they they know quality they know quality and they have choices now so if you're not if the church is not giving them quality to listen to or a quality message then they're not going to grow so all these components have to be have to really be thought of well in order to increase your membership so well, that's that's consistent with your uh advice to the musicians make yeah. sure you're up make sure you're at a professional level make sure you're at market parity but you're wrong for saying grandma singing out of key <laughs> <laughs> i know i know i know i know somebody's gonna listen and say oh man he hates grandma i yeah. love i love grandma i love grandma i, I don't think grandma out of key but grandson definitely out of key <laughs> <laughs> hey, so my last question what's next for you uh yeah good good question well i'm i'm i'm, I'm doing a lot of gigs now um i'm really fine-tuning my my sound um and i'm starting to write for my next album i have a single and i don't know which single is going to come out i don't want to talk about it too much but it is going to be coming out late august and um i've got so much material you know, one of the things that I want to do with this is, like I said, venture out. I don't know how much venturing I'm going to do on the first single. I'm really thinking through that now, but that's going to come out on the 28th. And then next year, I'll probably put out some more singles. I I hope to be able to put out an album late next year. I don't know if if I'll be able to, but that's my goal. That's my goal. And 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 next year really start doing some more festivals. That's what I want to do. Right now, there's so much stuff I'm doing internally. I've got like I have a TB. I got a book deal with TBN. Wow. Okay. That um, that I got to really prepare for. That's going to be released at the end of the year. So that's going to be that's going to be released towards the the holidays. So um, there's just a lot going on. Um, so I'm trying to set all that up so that next year I'm set up properly to, to actually go out and do some festivals. Good. Hopefully TBN and get you what a 360 deal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I love I love where I'm at. I was set up for those 360 deals, man. I, I right now we're doing really good in merchandising. So I'm trying to I, I don't want them to have nothing to do with my merchandising. Yeah, you're like, hold on, you you I gotta pay you for the shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, and uh, where can people reach you? Yeah, they can reach me at, um, they can reach me through Intervision Records or directly if they want, they can reach me through Kel Song. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Sounds of Sunrise Dash Entertainment.com. Okay, so they can, they can reach me there. 
I'm in the process of working on another website now that'll be up. Um, of course, I'm on all the, I'm, I'm on, I'm on social media. They can reach out to Facebook and so forth. Um, all my music is streaming all over the world, so that's not a problem. Um, if they reach me on Sounds of Sunrise dash entertainment.com um they can send me something I'll, I'll 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 chime them back or through instagram as well um and also facebook all right great it was a pleasure interviewing you it was such a fun conversation uh Love you today. you mind if we part on a dad joke i don't mind at all man okay so it's malcolm x's birthday's coming up so i got a good i got a joke a dad joke for you Okay. Who did Malcolm date before Betty Shabazz? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Tell me. His ex. <laughs> I should have guessed it. I should have <laughs> Well, you served that up. I should have guessed that. I should have guessed it. And with that, I'm your host, Jay, signing off. <laughs>